Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Muscat University's first in um, this academic year's public lecture series. I'm truly delighted to see so many of you here tonight. At Muscat University, we have made a commitment to ensuring that the university isn't just a place where we give out degrees. We want to make sure that it is something bigger, that we, are, we open up this, um, this place, we open up these lovely facilities that we have so that we can um, have public engagements. We give you, the public, an opportunity to engage on the most important topics that affect us all. Most importantly, though, we strive to make sure that our discussions are hot, are topical, and are of interest to the community in which we operate. So tonight, we'll be discussing globalization. After 30 years of robust growth um, if, of trade in an international world, are we facing a period of tariff wars and bilateral trade pacts rather than multilateral trade agreements? And what are the forces explaining this sudden change in global economy? I'm sure you'll agree that this is actually a very hot and topical issue, made even more so by recent comments by our good friend, Mr. Trump. So I think you'll agree that this is important. And who better to deliver tonight's public lecture than Lord Mengnal Desai? Lord Desai is a world-renowned commentator on globalization and deglobalization. He is currently chair of the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum Advisory Board, which facilitates discussion between key government and private sector institutions worldwide. He's also the founder, chairman of the Meganand Desai Academy of Economics in Mumbai, an Emirates professor at the London School of Economics, with which he's had a long history including as director of its Center for Study for Local Governance and founding member of its, de of its Development Studies Institute. Lord Desai was chairman of the UK Labour Party between 1986 and 1982. He started his professional career in the Department of Agricultural Economics, University of California in 1963. He was made an honorary fellow of the London School of Economics in July 2005. Professor Desai studied at the University of Bombay and continued to receive his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a recipient of several honorary degrees from universities such as Kingston, Middlesex, East London, London Guildhall, and Monash University, Australia. So rather than me taking up your time, I ask you, uh, and obviously on behalf of the board of trustees and board of directors, I wanted to thank you for accepting our invitation tonight. And I ask you to joining me, uh, join me in welcoming Lord Desai to share his thoughts with us tonight. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction, uh, Vice Chancellor. Uh, yes, uh, around about 1992, uh, I, I started a center for the study of global governance. And uh, I think I practically invented the word global governance myself, but I, I'm not so sure of that. And it was very surprising that at that time, the, even the word globalization was contested. I remember someone saying, globalization, whatever it means, uh, as it were, what is all this nonsense uh, going on? And people doubting whether the globalization had happened or was not going. Uh, it, is, it is exactly like the discussion we are having right now about artificial intelligence. And is it really happen? Is it dangerous? Is, is it sort of a myth? So on. And uh, the enthusiasts for globalization uh, were saying, oh, the, 
but the earth is flat or something like that. Somebody is saying the earth will become borderless. There will be no borders anymore between countries. There will be free movement of labor, free movement of capital, free uh, uh, goods and services trade. And clearly there was no doubt that something was happening in the early 1990s which was in terms of the previous 50 years unique. It was not unique in the sense that it was not the first time it was happening in the world. The world has globalized many times before. Uh, round about exactly 100 years before that, between 1890 and up to the First World War, one would say the world had globalized uh, very much. And then there are other episodes where you could say, yes, the world, world was globalizing. But we really want to discuss this particular phase of globalization because we forget that it's very recent. And it's possible for the world to go through cycles in which one phase of globalization is followed by deglobalization, whatever that is, and I'll come to that. And that's not the end of the world because mankind finds itself another solution to problems as these things arise. But very peculiarly right now, as uh, the Vice Chancellor said in our introduction, uh, because of Donald Trump, and, and along with Donald Trump, the other phenomena of the rise of nationalism and populism in rich countries. So nationalism has never been a problem, and never been absent from poor countries, from developing countries from ex-colonial countries. Their nationalism is always proved to be a positive force. So we had to point out to the Western world that nationalism is not actually a disease of any kind. But the developed world, especially the North Atlantic, uh, European and Americans, for a while got convinced by themselves that they had overcome barriers of nationalism and they were uh, creating a multilateral uh, globe based on human rights and liberal freedoms and things like that. Trade was very much central part of this. And it's really, I, if I'm just going to spend about five minutes telling you uh, how it became. Uh, because before the Second World War, free trade was not a uh, done thing. Most Today's developed countries, like Germany, United States, most of Europe except for Britain, developed through protectionism and all sorts of tariff barriers behind which they hid to create their industries. Then the theory arose that during the Great Depression, when Americans uh, uh, passed a law with 800 new uh, goods on which they put tariffs, uh, the, the Great Depression deepened and the world suffered because of protectionism. So when the war ended, one thing the Americans were willing to do, by that time they had become the most powerful nation, most powerful, most industrialized nation in the world, they decided that they'll have to build a new regime of what I call freer trade, less, less protectionism, lower tariff barriers and so on. And over the next 45 years, 1945 to 1990, there was a succession of negotiations. They were called rounds, Kennedy Round and Tokyo Round and things like that, in which developed countries met and decided mutually to cut their tariffs because they were exporting and importing manufacturing goods from each other and it looked profitable to do it simultaneously. Nobody wanted to cut tariffs unilaterally. At which point the developing countries said, hey, we want, some, uh, we want to be a part of this as well. Because by uh, late 70s, early 80s, because of the oil shock, a lot of industry, a lot of manufacturing industry was moving from Europe and America to Asia. Because costs had gone up, the, the continuous full employment in the Western countries had put up wages, and then, of course, when the price of raw material was oil went up, there was a profit squeeze. And so, as it happens, industry decided to migrate. 
And at that time, container ships had been invented. So you could just put a whole factory on a ship and go, which was not possible before. And there was communication satellite. So you could keep track of your factory far away by either telephone or by sort of uh, computer, computer management, computer engineering. And so, so suddenly there became, it became technologically possible to move industry from one part of the globe to another. And the traditionally cheap labor uh, rural economies started being industrial. And they wanted to, they had no demand at home. They wanted to be able to export their goods uh, to America and, and to Europe. So they said, give us a deal in the tariff. I think. Now, as this was going on, quite simultaneously on the other side, the Cold War uh, was in a crisis. Cold War ended with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the triumph of the United States. So simultaneously, by the early 1990s, the Soviet Union was no longer a power. All the world had become capitalist, more or less, except a few. And there was a World Trade Organization established for the first time in which all countries, most countries, were part of a single book of rules in which if you did something, your tariffs were low, you had to give certain guarantees of not subsidizing your home industries uh, illegally, not dumping, and so on. But that was, for the first time in, in modern history, we had a single trading system. And of course, you could take your money anywhere across the world because due to, again, due to computers and communication satellites, you could move money very fast. And for the first time, we were a single capital market and, and, a, and a single market for, for goods and services. There were, in, there were rich and poor countries, but that was it. And that multilateral system, last, I mean, it, we are still theoretically living under that multilateral system. So there's a big growth of trade. Uh, the volume of trade was growing very fast. And for the first time in, in modern history, uh, developing countries, or previously poor countries, were gaining as much from growth and from capital movements as rich countries. And that whole beautiful scenario crashed in 2008 because of financial crashes. Nothing was happening to trade, but finance, the financial markets overdid themselves and they crashed. And when the financial markets crashed, a number of countries began to rethink what was, what was the benefit cost ratio in this uh, globalized world. But by, you know, European Union, for example, is actually a customs union. A customs union is a big departure from free trade. Because what you say, we were a free trade within the customs union, but tariffs for outside. Uh, and so it's not actually a part of, a, not truly a free trade uh, liberalism, but they, they at least are better than they used to be uh, before. So European Union, United States, there's a large, large trading area. And then we have ASEAN uh, in, in Southeast Asia, and there are such uh, groups in Latin America and so on. Now, all along there was this uh, a growing imbalance in the world economy. An imbalance for the fact that America, uh, as a country, was living way beyond its means. It was, it, it was running uh, a, a trade deficit, large trade deficit. And of course, under Bush and uh, later Obama, it was also running a budget deficit. In American politics, it's very interesting because they, everybody talks about debt is bad, we must balance our budget. American budget has been in even small surplus, fewer than 10 years in the last 70. So they always talk about uh, budget balance, but nobody balances the budget. So there was a twin deficit, budget, and Americans converted that into virtue. He says, aren't you very good? We are the consumers of the last resort. The world is producing too much. If we did not buy it, the world would be poorer. That's why we ought to be congratulated. And now, of course, that was, that, that was not a sustainable case. But what happened in American politics, people began to notice after the crisis that 
there was something wrong with the system. One thing that was wrong with the system was that although America was prospering, American economy, like most Western economies, had changed character. They'd stopped being manufacturing economies. They're largely service economies. The UK right now is 80% of its GNP comes from services. Uh, and manufacturing um, employs less than 10% of the labor force. In America, a similar thing was happening. And in America, what is interesting is geographically, it was unbalanced because the service industries were growing on the East Coast and West Coast. You know, IT services, telecommunications, financial sector, all the, they were growing, skilled labor, good salaries, and so on. And the old manufacturing industries had been abandoned. Uh, look, at, look at what happened to Detroit. Detro Detroit is sort of shadow of its form itself. So in the middle, in the Midwest, there was this uh, really abandoned factories and real crisis of sort of perpetual under, underemployment. Once upon a time, an American worker could, could be guaranteed to have uh, a full-time job around the year and could make enough money to have a car and a home for his family. And now, if you're in the Midwest, you have to work, your wife has to work probably for more than one job, and you're still not, uh, not able to manage. So the tragedy of the Middle West was the tragedy of industrialization. But nobody noticed because the total numbers were growing up. Uh, and a lot of people had dropped out of labor. For, and it is these people who raised their voice. And the threat to globalization comes from the people who were displaced from their prosperity by globalization. And they voted Donald Trump in. Uh, what is very interesting about it is that Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump had the one advantage uh, when he was running for office. Nobody took him seriously. Now, he, is, he was actually among all the candidates, the only one who knew television professionally, who had actually done television very professionally. And because he came from outside the political circles, he had no discipline of the kind of making blind statements on every controversial topic. <laughs> he managed to make controversial statements on even blind topics. And so he knew one thing. You know, I don't know very many of you saw the presidential debates. When asked a question, Hillary Clinton always gave a very long answer. Half of it was about how, how she had done everything under the sun uh, and to, to prove that she was qualified and so on. And then she came to the answer of the question. By that time, people's attention had wandered off. Donald Trump knew that in a television audience, the attention span is very short. So his answers were two sentences. And they were sufficiently controversial so that in the, in the, news, in the news items following, everybody discussed the debate in terms of what Donald Trump had said, what gaffe he had made, what controversy had started. But that's the way to do it. That's the way to sell something. You don't sell things by being blind. He also devised a very good strategy of working out almost mathematically what is the minimum number of votes you require in American election to win presidency. Because American presidency is not in terms of total votes. Votes are not added up across the country. It is county back, you have to win counties. Because every county has a, uh, an electoral college. They're sending, they're sending the representative to the electoral college. And so each county, given the size and so on, so many representatives, if you win the county, all the representatives go to the electoral college to choose you. Some states have rules that the, the number is divided proportionally by the number of votes. Some states have the rule that uh, winner takes all. But anyway, these people then go to the electoral college, which meets in December, and they vote who is the president. So America. On the first uh, Tuesday of, uh, of November, uh, but it is decided sometime in December. And it is that election which Donald Trump won by 100,000 votes over all, over all the counties he won. The minimum number of votes again. 
Hillary Clinton got three million more votes, but a completely useless votes. Because for three million votes, you only got about five seats. If somebody added up the four counties of New York and Los Angeles together, gave her three million extra votes. The rest didn't matter. So anyway, so this, this man is, even now, even after two years, continually being underestimated, uh, you know, reviled, and everybody's waiting for impeachment and so on. I think that he has to be taken very seriously. And he is actually one of the most radical thinkers in that he is trying to change the world. He's trying to deglobalize the world systematically. And he's thought about it more than most people have thought about it. And he is going to get away with it. And his perspective is very simple. America was never a very, America for many years has not been a nationalist country. But the people who lost out feel more acutely that America is no longer great than the people who live you know, in this global life. Uh, and so they basically want America to be glorious again, i.e. back to being manufacturing a hub, back to employing these poor people who are living in the Midwest. And how do you do this? So Donald Trump has a vision of the world which is very simple. America is not part of any multilateral uh, coalition. America has to figure out who are its enemies. Its enemies are people with whom they have a large trade deficit. It's not a military war. It's an economic problem. So America's priority are China first, largest deficit with China, secondly, European Union, and thirdly, their partners in NAFTA. And America basically, uh, the idea is if America can sort out the trade deficit with these three, America will be all right. Whether it will help or not, we, we, I'll come to later on. So this is why he doesn't take Russia seriously. His, his perspective is non-military at all. I mean, even, even the way he has behaved with North Korea, I means he's actually, you know, he wants North Korea, South Korea to get some sort of a, a deal. Uh, he wants that to be diffused. So Japan, Japan can be helped and, and China can be hurt. If, Koreans, if the two Koreas get together, China gets a bit weaker. So, that's, but his main concern is, can I renegotiate the free trade treaty with China? Can I renegotiate with, can I put tariffs on Chinese, uh, Chinese goods and so on? No, it's, at first nobody thought anybody could be serious. We economists have long ago convinced ourselves, though not the world, that tariffs are bad and things like that. And uh, no, this, anyway, this fixed. So that's bad. Thank you. Um, everybody says, if you do this, you will harm yourself. What they forget is history, that their country actually is prospered through tariffs once upon a time. 50 years on or, or 70 years on, somebody's trying it again. And so the kind of world that Donald Trump wants is a series of bilateral relationships, not a single multilateral book of rules. A series of bilateral relationships, as far as he is concerned, for countries with which America has a trade deficit, it's a large trade deficit. If he can fix that, the rest of the world can take care of itself. He is not concerned. And the idea of making America great again is basically to have America uh, reduce the trade deficit, get some of the industry back home, and so on. Now, a bit of technicality is that in, in economics, if you run a trade deficit, you have to, you have to be able to uh, import capital. If somebody has to give you capital to be able to finance your trade deficit. People give you, people give you uh, credit or they invest in your country, and that's precisely what's happened. People are massively investing the surpluses they have in America in the American uh, financial markets, especially the Treasury bill market. China at one stage had $4 trillion of Treasury bills. Uh, and so China basically was taking money. Uh, I, I give an analogy of how you, it's, it's, it's like a drug dealer who sells you drugs, you give uh, him money, and then he gives it back to you to buy some more. <laughs> so, Amer so America was running a deficit with China. China was investing the surplus back into America, which kept the dollar very strong. 
and dollar being very strong, there was a trade di at a price disadvantage, and so and so you could you could go on like this. Uh, but at the bottom of it, there is going to be a problem that if America does balance its trade, it will have to do something about the outgoing capital flow. Donald Trump has just done something about the tax cut, which increases capital flow into into America, so the trade deficit has to go up by definition. But that's, we will we'll work out the story later on. So he has successfully renegotiated the North Atlantic Free Trade Area Agreement. Some people say they're very small changes, but at least he can claim. The NAFTA was never very popular in, in the, on, on the right wing of, of American politics. So he says, I've renegotiated that. He will renegotiate with China, and he will, I'm sure, renegotiate with the European Union. So he will create a new world. Now, what kind of world is it going to be? It's not going to be the end of the world. I mean, it, this is not going to be a crisis. Basically, the, you know, as technology changes, as, as uh, new goods appear on the scene, over the last 200 years, the world has again and again changed shape. And this is in the next episode in the way the world is going to change shape. In 1960s, some of you remember, I was, I was there in America at that time, so I remember very vividly. Uh, John Kennedy, president, uh, publicly criticized the largest corporation called U.S. Steel for what they call gouging the prices of steel, i.e. overcharging for steel prices. This was thought to be very shocking, a political interference in a, in a free enterprise country by the, by the president and so on. The interesting thing was U.S. Steel was at that time the largest manufacturing company in U.S. And it was also a vertically integrated company. It owned its own coal mines, it owned its own iron ore, all the transport lines bringing the inputs into its factories and uh, and go, things going out. Within 15 years, that whole strategy of vertical integration was no longer profitable. What we now have is what is called uh, sort of the production logistics in which some parts of a, a commodity are made in one region and another in another region, so practically no company makes a car entirely in one, one, on one side. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a Ford, Ford Europe, you make the chassis in one country and then you get the machines imported from another country and seats from another country. And this whole thing is so tightly timed, what's time inventory, that you have to have the logistics of these parts moving. So a lot of manufacturing trade is in intermediate parts, not in final commodities. Uh, now, that intermediate parts uh, trade very much requires no tariff barriers and fast movement because these, these seeds or machines have to arrive the morning they are needed, exactly at whatever time it is, and they have to be put in there and, and the finished car goes out. If you have tariff barriers, if there are checks and, and, and stoppages at border, this whole strategy fails. So what you will have very soon is rethinking of the manufacturing production strategy. People will say, no, we can't do it the old way. We have to now to go back to the original thing. But now we've got better technology. we got many more robots. We can, and we've got things like 3D uh, printing. Now, 3D printing, and I'm, I'm not practical at all, but I'm told 3D printing, you can make molds of things in-house, and you don't have to import things because you can do it uh, in, in your backyard, in, in, a, in a manner of speaking. So it could be that we now have the technological possibilities of reversing uh, the just-in-time production system, uh, distributed uh, you know, logistics of supply chains and so on, and we go back to the 1960s, but at a high level of technology. So I always say, the world moves not in circles, but in spiral. You get back to where you are, but you get back at a high level of technology. And then that makes it feasible. Now, what that means is that there will be a massive unemployment increase 
in the currently manufacturing Asian countries. Because they will lose. Uh, because people will make things at home in their backyard by using robots or, or by using a different kind of technology. And that will be, it will be possible to, to restructure the world. Now, you know, this, this, this may take, uh, take 10 years, 15 years, I don't know. But it is possible that the world is being deglobalized and reshaped that way. Now, one more thing. How much time do I have? <laughs> oh, five more minutes. OK. Uh, sorry? No, no. Uh, of course, yes, indeed. Uh, it's a one, one, uh, one thing uh, I, I want, want to add to this is that <coughs> politics in the globalized days was indeed, of course, very, very multinational, multinational, very global, very multilateral. And it, it seemed for a while that uh, as a uh, uh, Theresa May once said, uh, there are people who belong nowhere. Or, people who belong everywhere belong nowhere. Uh, I, it is global citizens are not, not proper people. You have to belong to somewhere. Suddenly, there is this politics in which the politics of belonging, politics of identity has become very important. The liberal politics did not worry about identity. You know, you, 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 you're a man or a woman, but you, you could be living anywhere, assuming you're rich enough to travel. But now, even in Europe, there is a tremendous rise of the national identity that in Germany, in Austria. You see the people, and you could almost imagine the European Union breaking up because the needs of the Italian are not meant by the general <coughs> rule book of the European Union. The Germans are getting very unhappy that they are subsidizing everybody else in Europe, or so they think, and they don't like it. The British are going out of uh, the European Union because they don't like free movement of people, they don't like immigration. And so suddenly, instead of seeing the world as a nice, happy place where people can move all over, all across borders, uh, borders and so on, it's breaking up into separate national entities. But that's exactly the world was like not all that long ago. So this is not news. What we really have to uh, uh, think about is will the world, when it goes back to a system of nation states, learn anything from the good experience it has had of preserving human rights and, and, and looking after its sort of gender equality, good, good environment, and all those things? Or Will they go back to being being kind of backward as well as uh, you know a, a, a nationalist? We don't know. It's 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 an, it's an open question, because certainly it is going to be very difficult to sustain globalization like it used to be and in its heyday, because the winners no longer like the system. And when the winners no longer like the system. That's when the system breaks down. Now, it's not, there's no perfect analogies in the world, but I'll end with one very worrying analogy for you. Uh, just, I, I don't want to leave you comfortable. I want to leave you worried and, and troubled. Uh, in 1914, the world was divided in certain powerful uh, countries. There was the British, the British and the British Empire, France and the French Empire, and there were the Germans who had emerged as a very powerful industrial country. But they had no empire. So they were unhappy with the then system of globalization. They wanted to change the rules. That's the globalization. Well, we, had a, we had a little war, uh, which lasted four years, which often nobody expected to last four years. They all expected it to last three months, but it lasted four years. And it completely ended that period of globalization. It took another, you know, so 80 years in the, in the 20th century to get back to globalization. Now, I don't know whether this globalization is going to end peacefully. I think it's not going to lead to a war between China and the United States. Uh, but it, it may actually break up into small uh, individual countries. And then we have to make quite sure that it doesn't lead to the sad uh, 
outcomes that they led to after the First World War. But who knows? Okay? Thank you. Well, what, what's worry. the point of making people happy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I get you to sit in the middle and then we'll take I questions? Can, I can sit, I can stand. Yes, I'll come sit in the middle. I'll come sit in the middle. Oops. Yeah. Here I am, yeah. A bit of exercise, yeah. That's good. Excellent. Well, there's so much food for thought. Exactly. And so many um, interesting open questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'll throw it to the floor and see what comes out. See what Absolutely. If anybody asks a question in Arabic, you have to translate. Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about um, manufacturing going back to the core consuming nations and look at the American example. There's talk of Apple having to manufacture in America rather than outsourcing it. You have talks of Ford having to stop production in Mexico mm. to continue production in, in etc. Mm. But at the same time, we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about robotics, we talk about the machine or mm. the intelligence replacing human mm. capital yeah. as investment. Would that also, that's not going to be a solution to create employment. No. So where is the solution? If it's going to create an unemployment situation, in the, in the core manufacturing areas now, and the unemployment situation still remains in the consumer nations, yeah. then where's the solution? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it, it, that, that, is, that is a major worry. You see, right now, uh, a, lot of peop, uh, a lot of people say, well, deglobalization cannot happen because it's economically not uh, profitable. You can't go back into national production systems. Well, the robotics makes that possible. The robotics basically makes that possible by having some labor within the rich manufacturing countries, plus robotics, to replace the Asian workers, just to, just to put it really crudely, because you know, robots are cheaper than Asian workers. Now, if that happens, uh, that is a problem for the Asian countries to reinvent themselves to find how they would, uh, they would create employment again. I mean, it may be that because of they are now more prosperous than they used to be, they can consume more of their own output at home, so their manufacturing doesn't wind down as much, uh, but there will be a problem. But there will also be a problem for uh, rich countries, and a lot of people are, are thinking about that, and that comes out of robotics and artificial intelligence. Now, one interesting insight in that is that uh, what can human beings do which robots can't do? I mean, what, what, is, what is something that uh, uh, human beings can do which artificial intelligence cannot do? And one of the answers, I'm not, and there's a big debate going on about that, one of the answers that I have is basically robots and artificial intelligence can do predictable things. The advantage is that if you can predict certain certain patterns, uh, then the machine can count and process faster than any human mind can do. So for example, uh, a lot, in a lot of diagnostics, now people are using artificial intelligence because you know, if the pattern of uh, your heart ailment is in terms of the uh, rhythms of your heartbeat or whatever it is, and if you need to quickly calculate, is this latest pattern out of sync or normal? The machine can do it very quickly. So a lot of those things, but what the machines won't be able to do is to do face with unpredictable uh, problems. And for example, in care of the elderly, especially care of people with dementia or Alzheimer's, these are non-predictable behavior, it's not predictable behavior. So one, one uh, forecast I have seen is that in America, 40% of labor force is going to be in healthcare. I, I mean, it's going to be massive. Because right now in the UK economy, our biggest problem is how to take care of the elderly. 
if there is a money shortage, there is a labor shortage, and suddenly the labor shortage becomes easy to manage because labor would be cheaper. Or, you know, somebody will come. Now, these are speculations, but that is the, the main thing is not so much the end of globalization, but the end of the production system and emergence of a new production system, which is basically how we have come last 200 years. Each time there's been an industrial revolution, we have come through a new production system, and we have found new jobs. You know, people used to say, oh, if computers come, you know, all the clerks would be, who would be unemployed and it'd be paperless economy and all that. No, we managed. We managed to create more or less enough jobs with each new wave of technology. Not without disturbance, but we managed. And for example, Asia would never have been richer without manufacturing and the technology to outsource those machines and take them across another part of the world. So from, from that, so it's a kind of contradictory result. Very hard to say. But these are the parameters which we'll have to think about. Somebody at the back. At the back. Uh, hello, sir. This is Bilal from Kashmir. Uh, I would, uh, you were talking about from globalization to deglobalization. So my question to you is like, where do you see education sector? Since most of us like belong to education sector, so how do you see it from? I mean, education. now the movement of the teachers, yeah. faculty is going around. So what? That's one. Second, uh, uh, again, from globalization to deglobalization, where you are seeing uh, the future will be more nationalistic. So yeah. how do you see new, smaller regions coming to, uh, I mean, I I I demanding for nations? So how do you see that? How so? Uh, uh, see what? A case of like uh, Kashmir, I mean, where the aspirations are for their seeking for the nation. So uh, how do you see that in now uh, the current situation? Yeah, I see the moment. What, uh, well, what, what was it? You probably heard Okay, you let me, let me, sir. No, I'll no, just. No, 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 I, it's just a matter of hearing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Tell me what is it. Yeah. Okay. One. That, no, uh, the first I understand. First you understood. Yeah. Okay. Second is like uh, from globalization to deglobalization where you are saying that it's getting more nationalized. So yeah from European Union yeah, breaking, yeah, yeah, they're getting sure. into nations and other yeah. things. So how do you see other nations, new aspiring regions, talking about nationalism? So how do you see that in case of like Kashmir? So how do you see that? Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, the second is, I, I kind of hinted at it because, see, nationalism was seen to be a problem by the developed countries of North Atlantic. They thought they had overcome nationalism because they had fought wars of nationalism in Europe. I mean, the entire European Union arises from the war between Germany and France from, you know, 1870 to 1945. So European Union is very proud that they have overcome, or they, were, they had overcome nationalism as a, as, a, as a disruptive force, and they become some kind of a, a glorious, you know, uh, era of universal peace. Developing countries have never had any problem with nationalism. They may have problem with the kind of nationalism you know, like, uh, like in India, they worry about Hindu nationalism or not. But by the nationalism is a positive force for developing countries because that is held these countries together. Because, you know, whatever we may say about the history of nations, nations are very modern phenomenon. They even, you know, every, every nation has to have an eternal history when it was born in 2,000 years ago. But most nations are, are a recent phenomenon. So to hold a nation together, you require some sort of ideology, and nationalism is the ideology which does that. Uh, now, in somewhere like Germany, they were trying to lose their identity to become European, and now some Germans, has, when this million immigrants came in, and now the Germans are saying, no, we don't like, we want to be Germans again like we used to be Germans. We don't like Italians or Greeks either. So the nationalism is a crisis for the for the multilateral North Atlantic world, it is not a crisis for the rest of us. The rest of us, we, we, you know. And so, in it, people start saying things as if what, what they believe is generally and universal, it's not. That's the whole crisis of liberal order is a story of the North Atlantic. It's not a story of the world. And we can do, do it differently. What would we will have big problem from is the massive change in labor flows. 
you know, I mean, what will happen if, let's say, uh, in the Gulf countries, uh, robotics becomes very popular? There'll be no immigration from the uh, uh, rest of Asia. What will Kerala do? You know, if there's no immigration. So those kinds of problems will arise. But it's, it's a different, gen uh, generically different problem. Now you're saying what about education? You know, either the education can be exported. It's a very new idea. Education has become a service which can be traded across the world. It's a result of globalization and the technology of globalization. Now, I think, you know, the very notion of higher education right now, or education itself, is at risk because in a world of Google, what can the university teach? You know, because once upon a time you went to university because libraries were there, there was a storehouse of knowledge. Now you just Google and find out. I mean, the conversation has become very dull because in the old days you used to worry about who did such and such. When you say, oh, hang on, here's the answer. Very, very boring and dull. Uh, but so universe, higher education itself is going to change here. You know, just as high street banks are closing down, High street colleges are going to uh, close down because nobody will need to go anywhere to get education except for interpersonal, uh, interpersonal uh, exchange of knowledge. I you know if you're in a classroom, you talk to each other while you're listening to the teacher. Now, in a number of universities, the teacher uh, puts, their, uh, puts their lecture on the podcast or whatever it is, and students can access it. Why does a student want to go to the classroom? <laughs> of course, of course. You may be the last university left. <laughs> but you know, it, it is, these are the kind of problems. You see, Oxford and Cambridge may, may survive everybody because they believe in one-to-one -one teaching. And basically, they've always had this idea that knowledge is not in books, knowledge is in what your tutor tells you. So it may be that we may have, see, I have always thought that when you go to university, the subject you do, is not all that relevant. <coughs> what you know, what you learn, is how to think for yourself. Because most things you learn, you forget. All the details get obsolete. And so you have to learn on the job anyway. But what you do, you learn independent thinking. That, that's all I taught my students. Uh, now, that element of independent thinking cannot be taught by machines. That has to be taught in a one-to-one -one or one-to-hundred interaction. And universities will realize that that is what, what's, what, will, what will be their uh, comparative advantage. I will sleep much better tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we take questions from this side of the room. Abdul Avri, thank you for the informative presentation. Um, I like the... Um, the way you describe the, um, the kind of the spiral thing, given the technology mm -hmm. involvement, mm -hmm. uh, I sometimes call it a pendulum movement, so it goes to the far right and then comes back to the far left. Sure. Uh, we see that things in, in politics and in environmental uh, aspects, in economy, economy, and various aspects of life. But given this movement, recent movement, uh, of the <coughs> globalization and the cutting, if you like, yeah. of the interdependencies between mm -hmm. nations, uh, and from your perspectives, you know, given what the region is going through currently these days, how do you see, for example, Oman as a country, for example, or the corporations of Oman, the big companies in Oman, you know, best place themselves to really be, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, ready mm -hmm. if deglobalization takes place? Yeah, you know, I think deglobalization is really a problem of large, large territories with a lot of manufacturing. Because what deglobalization is affecting is trade in goods. You know, a lot of, as I've seen, a lot of trade is in intermediate manufacturing goods. And a world of tariffs will change that and make it possible to have one location manufacturing activity like we used to have. Now, Oman, Oman is a, a service economy, as far as I understand. It's a nimble economy. It doesn't have a large territory. It has high value of human capital, and it has got uh, it has got experience of uh, finance, 
and, and things like that. Now those economies will always survive because these are, uh, uh, they don't have manufacturing as a large part of their economy. Now the problem always will remain with all economies, where are the new jobs coming from? And I think an economy like uh, Oman will have to get into artificial intelligence and robotics early on, you know, so that people are engaged in manufacturing those or creating those solutions. Uh, because once we invest a lot in human capital, once a lot in higher education, then that may become easier. I'm saying maybe because you need certain institutional incentive structures and so on uh, to, for, for young people to be able to get into this enterprising, you know, you know finding new, new ro robots, you know, designing new robots and so on, or new artificial intelligence tools, new fintech. But those are the kind of things. Uh, so you have to look at your, yourself as not, you're not China, you're not India, you're not United States. You are uh, Switzerland or Luxembourg or uh, something like that. And that's a dif different kind of economy. You know, it happened in Sri Lanka, that Sri Lanka was being a perfectly good trading economy. In 1950s, when a left-wing government came to power, a man called Bandar Naike, he decided that Sri Lanka had to be like India and had to have a huge manufacturing industry. They're completely unsuitable to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka doesn't have the labor force to do it, didn't have the territory to sell its product, and in practically like the economy. So you have to know precise, you know, manufacturing is for big countries, you know, Mexico, Brazil, India, and so on. It's not for small countries. Small countries have to be service economies. Of course, you know, everybody's shutting doors. Everybody's trying to make these. Sorry? Yeah. No, yeah. remains as a, a small hub. Yeah. So um, do you see, for example, that you know, we should make the kind of the NAFTA of this world, in a way, you know, strategic alliances, in a way? Otherwise, you know, don't is you think... It, there, there is still a lot of scope for strategic alliances vis-a-vis uh, -vis South Asia. You know, for, for, <coughs> for all for your, your Gulf neighbors and so on. But ultimately, I think uh, <coughs> you are you are a buyer of goods and not a seller of goods, not a seller of manufacturing goods. You are a seller of services. The question really is, where is your competition in the se services sector? Your competition will be in terms of the technological frontier you have to be at. Now, that is all Oman's investment should be in R&D. You know, R&D in terms of FinTech and artificial intelligence, all those things. Because that is, that is, the, that is the way for a, for a small open economy to, 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 to go. You, you go in alliance with other countries to make sure that your manufacturing supplies are safe. But you have a lot of economies to, to do that with. People will be willing to sell you manufacturing. They need that, they need your money. But you don't need to get into manufacturing. Somebody here? Yeah. Can we hear from uh, the lady here. Thank you very much, Yelan Lager from the University of Bath. Uh, I would like to ask, in terms of the development and the the deglobalization, how do you think the universal basic income comes into this conversation? Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm saying wow because yes. Uh, uh, Again, see, that is very much the thinking in developed countries right now, where everybody thinks that uh, artificial intelligence and robotics puts a big threat to employment. I mean, uh, the Labour Party has put a lot of uh, recent research into it. I was, I was doing basic income 30 years ago, and nobody was talking about it, because I thought, well, in my view, uh, basic income was a way of reforming the welfare state. By, by cleaning up all the various different entitlements, you have a single entitlement. And anyway, that's another story. Now, a lot of people think that if, as the, the nightmare goes, the nightmare scenario is that robots are gonna do everything, there'll be no human labor involved, right? Uh, if that happens, 
And if labor is not, human labor is not generating any product, exploiter or not, where do they, where do people get their incomes from? So the idea is basically the state provides a basic income regardless of whether you work or not. But where does the state get its revenue from? You know, do robots pay taxes? There, there's a lot of literature, do robots pay taxes? Or who owns robots? Will they pay taxes? And why would they pay taxes? What do you give them? So they will pay taxes. So it is, basic income is, a, is only feasible if you have a, a system in which you can identify the people who generate the income and the wealth and whether they are taxable or not. Now to the extent that you can raise tax uh, revenue uh, from or whatever, you know, uh, whatever source there is, Yes, but you know, these these industries can migrate, and so you you have so one has to be careful. I think that the how much to pay people and how to all those things have been worked out. The thing to be worked out is where are you going to get the money from. Now my answer also is partially that it's not going to be hundred percent unemployment. The kind of thing I was talking about, like healthcare and so on. There would be a lot, there, there'd be demand for human labor yet, because there will be a lot of things which you will need human labor for, which could right, you know, we are all focused on manufacturing. Manufacturing can be uh, mechanized, perhaps. But there are a lot of other things going on. Manufacturing has become less and less important part of employment, at least in rich countries. So we have to, uh, we have to see what will happen. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yes. Good evening. Um, my question is more about the definition or interpretation of the term globalization. Um, as mentioned by you as well, we often connect it to trade and the United States of America, both of which are very significant for Oman. But um, the Middle East, or let's say developing nations, Rather than globalization, as you mentioned, because sometimes they prefer nationalism and so on, sure. um, they go through some sort of um, Chinization or whatever you would like to call mm -hmm. it. Why is globalization always uh, kind of connected to the United States of America and not China? Because well, yeah. the, the only reason why I say mm -hmm. is if you, uh, as a spatial planner, and if you look at it from a spatial context, um, globalization occurs in cities, uh, let's say urban areas more so, but these urban areas when they're globalized always host some sort of Chinatown or in the Middle East, a Dragon Mart and so on. So another reason why I'm asking this, like Mr. Abdullah asked as well, for the context of Oman, we've got a free zone developing, a special economic zone developing, which is going through some sort of Chinization rather than globalization. Yeah. So okay, yeah. what is the connection between China sure, sure. and I will, I will, I will tell globalization? You. you see, basically, the, the, the thing, thing is that uh, uh, sort of, one can think about it in two, two different phases. Uh, when the oil shock occurred in 1973, okay, manufacturing became very expensive in the developed countries. So they started looking for where manufacturing would move to. Uh, where is cheap labor? Cheap labor, but economy which will welcome foreign capital, okay? In the 70s and 80s, China was not ready to do that. So we had what's called Asian tigers, if anybody remembers, there were Asian tigers, South Korea and, and Hong Kong and Taiwan and Singapore. Then there was second bout of Asian tigers, you know, the Malaysia and all that. Why? Because they were cheap labor countries which, which were open to foreign capital, and so you relocate your factory there. Then late 70s, early 80s, Deng Xiaoping changed the Chinese strategy. And China began to say, okay, we love foreign capital. Uh, you know, they, they, they started their SEZs and so on. And the growth of China between 1990 and 2010 is absolutely spectacular. 
a giant gain from globalization. Utana was one of the biggest gainers from globalization because once they decided to put their economy politically socialist but economically mixed economy, they just completely took off. Now, so the big story of globalization is indeed the fact that China is right now the second largest country in terms of GNP. Uh, and, you know, and India is seventh or whatever it is. Well, in, in mid-1960s, Henry Kissinger said, but if only India and China can feed themselves, the world would be all right. So there's a lot of pessimism. Now, so China, now the Chinatown phenomenon is a very different phenomenon. The Chinatown phenomenon is two globalizations previously, when uh, partly due to this thing about indentured labor, the Chinese labor and some Indian labor moved across the world. People from Bihar went to Mauritius and they went to East Africa and South Africa and to the Caribbean. But Chinese also moved. In the, they, they moved to West Coast of America, they moved to Latin America. But the Chinese retained their culture much more specifically, separately. China towns. There are no India towns. Indians mixed up. They, they kind of uh, learn the local culture, you know. While they maintain certain uh, separation, they by and large became invisible. And that's why we have China towns, no India towns. But they come from a previous uh, uh, story of migration. But you see the Indian diaspora and China's diaspora all over the world. Why? Because they were the two largest population countries. When the world needed labor, where else would they go but to China and India? You see, what will happen is very soon there will be 10 more questions. It, the questions only come towards the end. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, well, this question also is uh, regarding China, uh, yeah. but more specifically the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China has been acquiring uh, ports in different countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Oman yeah. even. And I also... Um, want to just bring up that the United States has been throughout its, uh, throughout its uh, history, pre-World War II, an isolationist country. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so uh, while Trump leads America to remove its hand from global politics or global trade, mm. wh whatever that means, and mm. uh, won't this just put China as uh, the leading global power, let's say, mm. uh, especially that they're trying to make uh, China the center of the uh, um, world trade. Sure. No, it's, oh, that, that's very, very interesting. Uh, kind of one, one way to look at historically is that China in the 18th century, maybe late 17th century, was the Middle Earth. It was the center. China is the longest uh, living single state in the world. You know, uh, the, the, the uninterrupted, China, when you look at China's history, they say, yes, in the second century BC, we had warring nations uh, in China. But since then, the dynasty may have changed, but China has stayed one. No country in Europe can match that history. But from after the Industrial Revolution, China lost out. China was never colonized, but they were deeply insulted that they had to give concessions to foreign nations on the seaports. So China wants its revenge back. China wants to be, the, again, the center of the world. And now they think, and especially uh, Xi Jinping, has, has really got that vision, that he is going to be known as the man who restores China. I mean, just as Trump wants to make America great again, but with a different strategy, like you say, going back uh, to, to its own borders and not worrying about the world, Xi Jinping thinks, no, China is now going to be all over the world like it used to be uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 17th century. There's a very interesting uh, story about how the, the, con uh, the ambassador from Britain goes to uh, China to, uh, to, 
to pay, you know, to kind of establish relations. And they think they have come to pay homage and, and surrender <laughs> to, to their Chinese sovereignty because they, they, they had never heard of what, what, what Britain was and so on, you know. There's a tiny little country somewhere there. Now, so in my view, the China, what's called the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, uh, they, they're, they're building these railways through Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan and all that. They're building a railway from Beijing to, to London, which I think is complete madness. I think it's a total waste of money. But you know, that, that's my, Chinese get very insulted when I say this. I think if you have money to spend, spend it on your own people. No country is so rich that all its inhabitants have got all that they need. So you know, don't 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 spend money building railroad in Pakistan or whatever it is. And the Pakistan railroad maybe for strategic purposes, but they they are trying that kind of they are lending money to people, so the money th that money will be used to import Chinese goods, and build the railways with Chinese labor. And how are those guys going to pay the money back? In, in Malaysia, that question has arisen. In Sri Lanka, that question has arisen. Anyway, that apart, basically, so China is trying to become once again the hegemonic country in the world, like America used to be. And Trump, at least, if not the rest of the Americans, he decided we're not interested in the rest of the world. We've got enough resources at home. We can be perfectly happy and rich, and the hell with the world. It's, it's, it's not quite realistic because America makes a lot of money out of the world financially. And Amer American, a lot of American income comes from the financial. And of course, a lot of services itself, Amazon and, and, you know, and Apple and all those people are interested in selling things in the world. So, but America was isolationist because America never wanted to get involved with the rest of the world in military adventure. Twice, First World War and Second World War, they fought. And then for another 70 years, they, they, they fought the Cold War. America you know, now says, who is it? So is, they're both changing in very different ways. Now, whether there will be a single hegemonic country or the world will be multipolar, who knows? But America definitely is going to rethink its priorities. You see, for Europe, NATO is very good because Americans spend all the money about, about Europe's military uh, protection. Germany doesn't spend any money on its own defense. It's absolutely shocking, a very rich country. So I think Trump is going to abolish NATO one of these days. He's going to say, okay, enough of this. The Cold War finished, you know, 20 years ago. What am I spending money here for? I go home. I take my troops home. That's, that's when Chinese will move in. That's life. Thank you very much. I'm going to wrap up questions. We do have um, light snacks outside. We continue the conversation. So I must ask a question of myself. Sure, and I was please. hoping somebody would ask. Yeah. What's your money on? What's the bet? Will Trump be reelected? Oh, yes. <laughs> Without yeah. doubt. Without so a doubt. Because, because, because right now, in terms of public standing, Trump is very high. I mean, the, the, the poor people who never expected Trump to win are going berserk. They're so mad about this. They go on writing books and so on. But they don't realize that, that, that the game, Trump has changed the game. Trump has fundamentally changed the game. He's, he's, he is whatever it may he may look like, cleverer than most people. Oh, now I can't sleep here. <laughs> yeah. No. Yes. yes. But the question yeah. is, will America remain? Is this the rise and fall of America for 30 years, 40 years? You know, actually, America has forgotten the madness of its previous presidents. You know, the idea that American presidents have insane people is a complete myth. <laughs> you know, you just have to look at, I mean, Richard Nixon was seriously mentally unbalanced. And his staff had decided, this is true, that they will not give him the nuclear button without consulting the defense secretary. They, they had that little faith in his sanity. And they were very worried about President Ford because they thought he was so dumb that he wouldn't understand what to do. I mean, these are, these are both true stories. With, with, with Trump, the danger is not that he is dumb, but he may just two o'clock in the morning start a nuclear war. You know? <laughs> but the, the, I know there's one, one interesting thing which has happened, which is why we won't have a third world war, uh, is the nuclear weapon has made general war impossible. It, just, it is just, just not part. You know, only one nuclear weapon has, and it's not even quite nuclear, on, uh, it's nuclear, not thermonuclear has been only exploded on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
never since then. You know, India and Pakistan, whatever they may say, are more at peace with each other than they ever could be because they know they can't fight. They know they can't really fight a serious fight in which one would lose so much that we tempted to use. So there we are. Let every country have a nuclear bomb and the cover will be safer than it ever has been. Okay? Thank you very much. Now that will really make you not sleep. Absolutely. <laughs> I must say that for me, an evaluation of a good lecture is one that leaves me with more questions than answers. Exactly. And you've definitely exactly. done that for us tonight. Exactly. Lots of questions, lots of yeah. food for thought, lots of food for discussion as well. That's right. So on behalf of the university, I would like to thank you, but I'd like to ask Dr. Jamai, if you don't mind, to present you with something very small as in a memor memorabilia from uh, Muscat University.